the Lord. I know you'll continue to pray for Mary Sue. This has been about three weeks that uh, she's been in and out of the doctor's offices and diagnostic testing for a pinched nerve and almost um, at times can only move around. But um, well, she's got a good spirit. She's going to survive that. She reminds me of the time I jerked on that uh, weed eater <laughs> and got down in my back. I said, please, don't wish that on anybody. But God is sufficient, isn't he? God is able to do what he's promised. You know, our pastor is preaching with passion, isn't he? I've noticed over the last couple of months his preaching with more passion. And not that he isn't a man of passion and a preacher with passion, but it's for our congregation here. It's for, for us. So continue to heed what the preacher is saying when he addresses you or preaches to you on Sunday morning and Sunday night. This place will be filled with people. The Spirit of God will fall. And the Spirit of God is falling. And so we give Him, that is the Lord, the praise. Now you know I started last week when we were addressing um, the fruit of the Spirit. And I said that I would pluck faith out and talk a little bit about faith and faithfulness. And I'm going to continue that tonight. And I, I put it like this. Uh, focus, agree, invest, trust, and hold on. F-A-I-T-H. Lord, bless tonight. We've heard the prayers of your people. And all the petitions that have been offered, we know that you listen, for your ear is not deafened, and you reach, for your arm is not shortened. We appeal to your faithfulness and know that you haven't abdicated your throne, you're still on the throne, and you still answer the prayers of your children. We've seen prayers being answered across these United States and we rejoice that God is being lifted up and prayer is being offered throughout this country and around the world. Bless and touch us and oh Lord bless America. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now right before we get to agree... That's the uh, F-A, then I-T-H. I'm going to try my best to finish it all tonight. I want to say a little something about identity. If my identity is in Christ, who I am inside will be visible in my actions. A life lived in the Spirit is marked by certain behaviors. The life of my life, not my appearance, is what's inside here. Again, we repeat Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. So I want to remind you, and let this be an underlying factor of all of my uh, teaching or preaching on this subject, that growing spiritual fruit requires transformation of mind. The transformation of the mind is very important in the growing 
of spiritual fruit. Because what I think and believe determine how I act. Suzanne Wesley, the mother of the great John and Charles Wesley, and the mother of about 17 kids, maybe a little more. She said, there are two things to do about the gospel. She said, believe it and behave it. You've got to believe the gospel, and you've got to behave the gospel. So Ephesians 4 and 23 and 24, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Praise the Lord. And then I wrote down 2 Corinthians 3. 16 through 18 today, and I hope that I can read my scribbling. Thank God for the law, but thank God for grace. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is liberty. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Praise God. I read those scriptures again today, and I said I had to preface my remarks with this little introduction. Because identity is important. Faith is not just what we believe, as I've said, but how we believe it. The strength of our confidence in life and witness depends on the character of our faith. Now there's a Greek word that's translated in the English for full assurance. Paul describes Abraham's faith as being fully assured. Romans 4 and 21, that what God has promised, He was able to perform. Do you still believe that? Whatever He's promised... Now, I've read a whole lot about Herman Locklear. He was for so many, many years, years and years ago at Moody Bible Institute and Moody Church. He said, and I haven't counted them. I'll just take him at his word. He said there were 32,000 promises in the book. Well, they are yea and amen to the glory of God. How many of you believe in the promises of God? The promises of God are there. So Paul describes Abraham's faith as being fully assured. And he wrote to the Colossians in Colossians 2 and 2 about the spiritual wealth. He says there's spiritual wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. And thank God the results are in a true knowledge of Christ Himself. So we have full assurance, amen? Praise be unto His name. Hebrews instructs us to draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. An instructive account concerning faith proved in adversity is demonstrated by how differently Mary and Martha responded when Jesus did not arrive in Bethany before their brother Lazarus died. You can see that in John chapter 11. uh, 32 verses there. When When she heard that Jesus was coming, Martha went out to meet Him. And you know Mary stayed at the house. But here's what's important. 
Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. How many of you still believe no matter what, God will give it to you? And there's a beautiful story. I won't rehearse that story in uh, Mark chapter 9. But um, it's, it's a beautiful story there. Read it sometimes if you get a chance. And you see the boy's father cried out after Jesus' disciples unsuccessfully attempted to cast out the demons from that man's son. Jesus rebuked them for being unbelieving. Then Jesus said to the Father, All things are possible to him that believeth. Now I made sort of a little mistake then. I put the pastor's glasses on instead of mine. And it was a little blurry. So, so I, ooh, I see better. I, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to get at it now. I wondered what was a happening there. But Jesus touched me, praise the Lord, and had me to go under this cover here and find my glasses. You know, I still believe that the Lord can let you go to the end of your life with your eyes not being dim. How many of you recall a great leader? Huh? So, so we believe the Lord and we have hopeful anticipation and we know that um, we receive from the Lord what we ask of Him. Now let's look at uh, the letter A and C, agree. I find with faith it's only one thing to see, and that's opportunity. Opportunity. It's another thing to see that you are part of the opportunity and God wants you to be involved from your heart, at least 51%. Everybody ought to be at least 51%. But strive on for 100%. How many of you call that great story in Numbers chapter 13? Going on down to Numbers 14 and 9. That most famous account in the Bible regarding the importance of putting the word agree with the word focused. How many of you remember the Twelve spies that, that went in to spy out the land of milk and honey. Great large grapes. I mean, it was a land of abundance. But the ten spies said, we are as grasshoppers in their sight. Land of giants. How many of you have said, but we are mere grasshoppers spiritually when the devil and his hordes come up against us. Hey, if the Lord said take the mountain, we can take the mountain. If the Lord said take the country, we can take the country. And Caleb and Joshua said, let us go up at once and take the possessions for we are able to overcome it. Thank God for ever increasing faith. Thank God for the overcoming spirit. Thank God for taking the land for Jesus. And did you know, Caleb and Joshua were the only ones that were able to go in the promised land. Oh, sometimes people may not agree with what the good book is saying, but I say to you that faith, focus, and agreeing is very important in this walk of faith. Forsaking all, I trust Him. F-A-I-T-H. I'm going to agree, and we can agree together that this church is going to be filled, that our parishioners here, our friends and the members and those that are yet to come are going to be moved by the Spirit of God and there's going to be salvation in families. There are a lot of family members that need to be saved. 
We can agree. We can have faith. So go back and read that story. There in Numbers chapter 13 and, and, and 14 and, and see what we're saying. Then look at the word invest. I still believe that faith is a venture. Faith is a risk. And it involves investing. I won't be able to go through all of um, Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus tells the parable of the talents. But that's a very important parable for you uh, to read and see what investment is all about. And faith. I have faith in the Master. I have faith in, in the talents that He's given me. I have faith that one of these days I'll stand before Him and He'll say, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. So Jesus tells us to occupy until He comes. Occupy from the Greek where we get the English word uh, pragmatic. Jesus is saying, pragmatize until I come. Be pragmatic. Be occupied in business. I with the five talents, doubled them. Guy with the two, doubled them. Guy with the one, didn't he bury the talent? Wasn't he afraid? having all kinds of excuses about how hard the Master was and what was expected. I'm telling you, you got to invest. Invest your time. Invest your monetary blessings. Let God touch you. So, faith without works is dead. Is that Bible? Oh, yes. So I advocate investing. Investing. Oh, I'm looking for the Lord's call to enter into the joy of your Master. He's coming one of these days, and you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to be hopeful. And you're going to have to be occupying. There's so many things. You know, you can't um, get too old to serve God. Not too young to serve God. I'm telling you, people are still trusting God in these last days. And I, I tell you what, I wouldn't want to pastor a church without children. And I wouldn't want to pastor a church without senior citizens. So give me all. Oh, I've been privileged, as the pastor uh, has too, I've been privileged to pastor some wonderful churches in my time. And I can say by God's grace and His help, I never left a church the way I found it. Praise God for growth. Praise God for blessings. Praise God for eager hearts that are in there helping you all the way. You see... All of us are ministers. And we've got to be able to walk the walk of faith. I'm not just talking uh, to people who haven't experienced the outcomes of trusting and being faithful. But I'm encouraging you. I'm imploring you to still walk the walk and talk the talk. Because the Lord is surely coming again. I'm going to be reading Hebrews 11, 32 through 38 in just a moment. But let's take a look at T, trust. We've seen focus. We've seen agree. We've seen invest. And I could preach a sermon on each one of these and preach it 30 minutes at each shot. So I'm just hitting the service here, the surface. Faith at its deepest level is trusting God. Remember that. Faith at its deepest level is trusting God. 
You know, I love the definition of faith that is found in the example of Hebrews chapter 11. May I read that with you, beginning with verse 32. And I'm reading from the King James. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies, or put out the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheep skins and goat skins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Man, wow. Hebrews chapter 11 is faith's hall of fame. If you want to get into the hall of fame of faith, you've got to understand what the forefathers have gone through with. Oh, man, I, I've read that uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs. I, I've had the stu study of religion from day one through, uh, throughout the, the ages. You know, I, I, I see the martyrdom that's happening in the world today. Over in the Sudan, Nigeria, other areas that I'm not uh, in my deliberation, in my talking to you, perhaps can remember all these areas, Somalia. Wherever they are, people are laying their lives down for the cause of Christ. Just like that um, pastor, and he was a Pentecostal, he was a Assemblies of God pastor in Iran that they had him incarcerated and was to, to kill him. Now his lawyer is imprisoned. Thank God for Jay Sekulow. Thank God for that bunch out of, um, out of uh, Virginia Beach that don't mind telling it like it is. Some things you, you take and filter it out. But when you see people being tortured and murdered for the cause of the gospel, we're to pray. But these people are willing to lay their lives down. And we can't get people to get up on Sunday to come to church. Wow, that sounds like a pastor. Well, that came to my mind. <laughs> oh, but I know God is real. Don't you know He's real? And He's going to see you through. Faith is believing on the one hand when He leads people to victory that He's in it. And it's believing, on the other hand, in the worst that comes, that we yet trust God. That's what trust is. Trust is a key element of faith. Oh, we're joyful when the good times are rolling on. When everything's all right and the cupboards are filled and the freezers are full. When everything seems to be all right amid the partying and the banqueting. 
but when times, lean times comes and when distractions have our focus and discouragement sets in and disappointments are setting in to the place where we can't understand, we have a right to question the Lord, but we must trust Him anyway. So when you're knocking and you seem to think the door is not opening, there's an opportune time. Just hang in there and believe the Lord. Just like I heard one uh, preacher, you know, black preachers can preach. I mean, if they're anointed, they can preach. Not, disc not trying to sound uh, uh, racist or anything, but those guys can preach. One guy said, what you need to do is to hang on, and if you still feel like you're slipping, tie a knot on the end and hang on. Well, when I was swinging across what they used to call the ice, ice box when I got through playing ball, and we'd go to the ice box there. Boy, you're talking about a Danish cold plunge. That was a Danish cold plunge. And we had a knot, a knot on the end of that rope. And it would give us a secure fit. But sometimes you'd slip and it was a hurry of you getting out of the icebox. I'm telling you, sometimes you may be slipping. Sometimes you think that you just cannot hold on. I'm going to encourage you. To hang tight. To hold tight. That last word is what gets faith coming all together in the end. Is holding on tight. Hold on to the horns of the altar. My God is sufficient. He's not a Palestinian legacy or theory figment of the imagination. God is a personal spirit who in love creates and sustains and orders all. This is the Lord that we serve. And He's going to see us through. Now, I'm not old enough to have read a McGuffey's Reader. Anybody know what a McGuffey's Reader is? I see, yeah, McGuffey's Reader. When I started schools, when I was blessed to start schools, I, I, I used um, Accelerated Christian Education and, and the books and a lot of things that you could get out of their publishing house out of Louisville, Texas, was McGuffey's Reader. And so we had them scattered around the library, and sometimes there was a reading from the McGuffey's Reader. Well, there's a story about a clock in the old McGuffey's reader that had been running for a long, long time on the mantelpiece. And one day the clock began to think about how many times during the year it would have to tick. So it counted up the seconds. 31 million. 536,000 minutes in the year. And so the old clock got tired of thinking about it and said, I can't do it. And stopped right there when somebody reminded the clock that it did not have to click 31,536,000 seconds all at one time. But rather take one by one. One by one. And the clock began to run again and everything was all right. 
Got to remember then when holding tight, not everything has to come to pass today. There are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour and 24 hours in a day. And you go on down through the time and just hang on and believe that God will give the measure of strength and faith that you need for today. Today is, is precious. Only be reminded in hindsight about yesterday. But live for today and have hope for tomorrow. And God certainly will see you through. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, trust Him. We're in a rat's race. I mean, people's in a rat's race. We're in a digital age. High tech age. I'm telling you, now... I only handle this little old thing. It's got a camera, but I never use it. My daughters, they got them droids, they got all these here different things, and they can send me this and send me. Daddy could, no, I'm not a buying one. All I want is to be able to communicate on my Facebook or with my emails and my cell phone. I'm not interested. But you can't tell that to kids in school because that's a part of the curriculum. Man, you ought to have seen me. And this has been, this has been uh, 12 years ago when I received my doctorate from Erskine Theological Seminary in Associate Reformed Presbyterian School. The guys around me had all kind of them little devices they had all kinds of recorders and they could uh, process quickly and in two hours time they had their papers. But old Doc, he was pushing the pen. <laughs> you know? That's why I write like a real doctor, you know, to keep chicken scratch and sometimes the pharmacist can't understand the prescription but I wasn't going to be deterred I mean I was an old guy and there were some guys in there in their 20s in their 30s my, my nephew pastors that prestigious church in Augusta Georgia Stevens uh, Creek uh, Community Church started with about 40 and he's running probably somewhere around 13, 1400. He was two, um, he was two uh, years um, before me graduating from that same school. And uh, I'd see him when I'd go over to his um, dad's place, still using that equipment, and that's good. But I made it anyhow. I made it anyhow. And one of my great secretaries at Sanford, I paid her like three fifty four bucks a page to type my uh, essay papers and type my dissertation, and it had to be flawless. It had to be without grammatical error. But see, I had some assistance. I couldn't type up the dissertation. It had to be professionally done. But it got done. And about two weeks before the time, it takes you, may, may I, I, I'm not trying to brag on myself. I'm trying to give to you an illustration of hanging on. One of the major professors called me and said, uh, Wesley, did you know you're on the brink of having to take a, a leave of your program? Because... Uh, Time is running out. I said, Dr. Johnson, please. I'm pastoring. I got this and that to do. 
He says, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to enforce this rule if in 90 days you don't have that dissertation in here. Man, you're talking about working. You're talking about spinning the midnight oil. But I hung in there. And I've seen why God allowed me to go through that. Sickness, you know, you could use a lot of things to hold in there. Sickness. A lot of discord. And you want unity. And you still have to hang tight. Do you remember what Habakkuk said? This prophet was asking God, why didn't he do something about the sin of Judah? Why didn't he do this and that? God said, I'm going to do something about it. The Babylonians are going to come and invade your land. And Habakkuk said, in essence, that's an awful perverted concept of justice. The Babylonians are worse than the worst people in Judah. God said, eventually I'm going to punish the Babylonians too. But you won't see it. All that rectifying of evil won't take place in your lifetime. Read the book of Habakkuk. And here's what you get out of that. So what are you going to do, Habakkuk? What are you going to do, brothers and sisters? I'm going to live by faith. Because the just shall live by faith. What's to keep you in times when you don't see the end result? Faith in God holding tight. It's saying persevere, continue, hold on. If you want the full dimension of faith, focus, agree, invest, Trust and hold on. That's what it's all about. Just in simple terms, hold on to God's unchanging hand. Hallelujah. I said, hold on to God's unchanging hand. Hallelujah. He'll never let you down. He was with our dear brother in his fall. I'll tell you, when I didn't turn on the light several weeks ago, and I, my stairs go down and then this way and then down this way. And when I got down to that last little old platform, somehow my slippers got tangled with my other slipper and I fell down the stairs. And I said, wow, I must have some strong bones. I must be fit. No. Something spoke to my heart and said to me, now you'll be a pragmatic guy. Now you'll turn the light on. And now you'll just walk barefooted in them, instead of them large bedroom slippers you got. That the back of it has caved in. You know what I'm talking about? Oh yeah! It was a teaching session for me. And so now there's something in my mind and heart. Flip that light on, boy. How many of you glad for God to speak to you in a consciousness to hang on? Praise the Lord for His glory 
and for his mercy. I'll tell you this one story as you stand. And then the pastor will come for the, his final remarks and prayer. I remember reading the story of Dr. George O. Woods telling about his uncle. Dr. Wood is the presiding presbyter or presiding bishop of the Assemblies of God. And I read a lot of his material. I read a lot of Lamar Vest and Swindoll and Ray Hugh. You know what I'm talking about. So I, I, I get from him some good illustrations. The year was 1927 in Tibet. As between Western China and Eastern India, this Assemblies of God missionary had a little boy, five years old, died. A few months later, the missionary's wife died. Permafrost, you know how, how in that region of the world and in, in some areas you can't hardly dig a grave. But one or two of his servants helped dig a grave for his little boy. And they placed his wife in the grave with the son. And missionary history states in this diary on his way walking across Tibet and he was the first Caucasian to walk from China to the Indian India boundary. And you know how often we speak at gravesides and we recall things. He wrote in his diary, Although here lies my precious loved ones that I buried in this foreign country, I will determine in you to stay in Tibet until everyone has heard the gospel at least one time. Now, friend, that's holding on. Friend, that's holding on. We can say a whole lot about Brother and Sister Papa Seal and, and other great missionaries in our church. We can say a whole lot about Dr. Ingram. And I have that book, his missionary book that he wrote. That sometimes would travel the world on his own expense. But I'm going to tell you something. They left a legacy. And they left a journey of faith. That is good illustration for us today. I want to hold on. I don't want to be known as a, a great preacher or an orator. I just want to be known he was a Christian and he served his Lord faithfully. Let's lift our hands as the pastor's coming and just praise him here tonight. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We magnify your name. Hallelujah.